This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Thank you for joining us. Open phones at 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. Two two five. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, host of the Ken Coleman Show, is my co-host today. Open phones at triple eight eight two five five two two five. Now Ken talks about careers and talks about your job on Sirius XM on seventy-five radio stations and on a very popular YouTube and podcast show as well. All one show just shows up a lot of different ways, a lot of different places. So we'll take your questions about your jobs, about your life, and about your money and i'm happy to do that today Uh, around ramsey uh we are grieving today Uh, a friend of mine over 25 years uh talk radio host phil valentine passed away over the weekend and uh he and i've been friends a long long time we uh did a lot of uh we've been on the radio same radio stations many times we've been on opposite radio stations lately here in nashville uh but we've always been good friends and always shared a lot of uh viewpoints and um of course we've been in touch with he's been uh battling covid and uh, we've been in touch with him his wife uh the family over the last many many weeks while this this struggle has gone on but it um it ended with him graduating to heaven on saturday and um just uh uh kind of hard to believe a little bit yeah, still a young man, somebody that's a contemporary of yours. You guys came together in WTN, and both of you had national influence, uh, friends. In fact, I was just thinking uh, when I got the email from you on Saturday that we were uh, – the last time I was with him and you in the same place was uh, uh, at your house back in March. Yeah, we had a bunch of uh, bunch of influencers yeah. there, and I uh, got a picture with him and Mike Huckabee. I sent it to Mike um, yeah. and sent it to his wife Susan as well. Yeah. Uh, over the weekend, I found that in my in my roll up there. Sharon actually had the picture. Sharon oh, took wow. it. My wife and so, but we've been again friends a long, long time. And um, you know, th- this brings about a, a lot of things. Um, but one of the saddest parts of the whole thing is to watch the number of people in America today that are happy that someone is dead that they disagree with. Yeah. On anything. I mean, he was a conservative talk radio. So the number of people that didn't like his stance on COVID issues or on political issues that have come out and um, said they're glad he's dead. I mean, you guys, really, um, there are people that I absolutely detest what you believe. I think you're a backward socialist communist, but I am not. If you die... And, and you say something about that. That doesn't say anything about him when you do that. It says something about you. You classless, immature, unbelievable people. Yeah. And and Twitter is particularly bad. Of course, Twitter's just full of trolls. Billy Goat Gruff needs to get in there and deal with the trolls mm. on Twitter. But yeah. <laughs> um, that's an old one. But, yes. um, but you know, it, it's just, um, it, it, it's aggravating and, and i you know i've never I, i've done a lot of things and run my mouth on a lot of things and said a lot of bombastic crazy stupid butt stuff over the years but i have never trashed somebody that died yeah happy they died yeah. because i disagree with them i got the same thing when rush limbaugh died um that, oh, you know. it's, it's unbelievable we've dehumanized ourselves i mean now it's like if you don't agree with me or even worse if you say something uh with some passion and some fervor that i really disagree with you are now dehumanized and so we're treating people as though we've we've forgotten that they have a family we've forgotten that there are there's a wife involved uh well, brothers it, sisters friends kids it's and crazy. again again just just to reiterate when you do that it doesn't say anything about no that. No. It says something about you. It says that you're, you know, that you really are a child. 
You really are an immature child. And political people have done that. I noticed one of the senators or somebody the other day said something about they wish Mitch McConnell was dead. I saw that come oh, yeah. through the news feed. Sure. And it's just, you know, I hope he died or he got COVID. I hope he dies from it or something like that. Oh, I'm like, yeah. oh my God. You know, it, it, even if you were so unbelievably horrible person that you thought that, and probably all of us are that horrible a person. We probably have thought it, yeah. you know, uh, but, but the fact that you open up your mouth and say it out loud, oh, worse yeah. than that, you do it in a public manner oh, yeah. on social media, <laughs> just says what a horrible place we have come to yeah. uh, in our decorum. We ought to be able to argue and fuss and fight. And, and take an idea and wrestle that idea or that concept to mask or not to mask, to, to vaccine or not to vaccine, to block out people based on either one of those or not. You ought to be able to have that argument and have a discussion yeah. about that without absolutely having to destroy someone and, and just believe that. that and and it, it's just horrible horrible because phil of course had come out uh, uh, initially and later on recanted that but had come out against vaccine the vaccine and then uh you know once he had covid and was in the hospital he said he wished he had taken it yeah. and that was his stance on it and his family came out with a statement from him on that um and regardless of that but i mean the number of people it's just it's sickening it's yep. really sickening so anyway we'll be um, um actually we're hosting the funeral here Oh, the service is going to be here at Ramsey in our amphitheater. Oh, and um, uh, it's the only place large enough and it's outdoors, which uh, the family was concerned about, it, you know, being outdoors with COVID and everything. So um, we'll be doing that. But uh, um, on quite an honor. Yeah. To, to get to do that. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, I just think some of you guys out there and, and you know what, if you don't want to listen to the Ramsey show because I say stuff like this, that's fine. I'll get along without you. I'll be just fine. Um, and, and, you know, and if you're that kind of person that says and does stuff like that, I just assume you went somewhere else. It'd be fine. Because if you said it in my presence, in my physical presence, I'm not sure I'd be, um, I'm not sure I, I wouldn't be spending some time somewhere in the pokey after that. Well, that's just so, it, Dave. Nobody does They don't that. have that. Or they're they're no. cowards. It's social digital, media. Digital courage. Yes. The, the social media uh, filter has, if you has had, removed I mean, I you from a redneck neighborhood. If you said stuff like that to somebody's face. You wouldn't have any teeth. Yeah. You get, you know, you say something about their mama. Yeah. You get jacked up. Yeah. You know. It's absolutely right. And so, but nowadays you can do that oh, and yeah. be a complete wuss and yeah. hide in your mother's basement. Yes. And so, uh, but you don't have the courage no. to do it anywhere else. We don't even have your real name or real face on the Which, avatar. by the way, wouldn't even have most of the things that these people lob out on, on social media. If they had to say it to somebody's face, Dave, they would choke just trying to get the words out. Yeah. yeah. Just trying to get it out. The boldness, the There's cowardice. Not it. It's not it. And the thing about those of us in talk radio, it's our job to say stuff to mess you up. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And we're good at it. And, yeah. and, and Phil and me and people like us that have done this on a national level for decades, yeah. it's our job yeah. to have the courage to say things that you're thinking or have the courage to say things that really upset you. It, it, and we're good at our job. So, you know, that, that, that's the thing. What makes our show unique is that we genuinely care about our listeners. We're intentional about choosing the best advertisers to recommend. Blinds.com is no exception. They offer high quality window treatments at unbelievable prices and they make it simple to shop blinds, shades, and interior shutters with easy online ordering, free shipping, and a guaranteed perfect fit. Go to Blinds.com and take advantage of this week's special savings. Coleman Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Rick is with us in Saratoga, New York. Hi, Rick. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. 
Hey guys, how are you? Such an honor to be speaking to you. You too. What's up? Uh, so I kind of have a career question for you guys. Uh, my wife and I were on baby step two. Uh, we have 180000 in student loan debt. And uh, I'm in the process of working with proximity principal. Um, so I have a great mentor, and he's uh, kind of helped me get clear on where I want to go and has offered to uh, make some introductions for some informational interviews. And just wanted your advice on this kind of get started phase on the process, you know, how I can put my best foot forward, any mistakes to avoid. Yeah, well, you know, here's the thing. If you're really, really prepared in the interview process itself, and it seems like uh, you kind of broke up, is he helping you with some of these connections so you're going into these interviews a little bit warm? Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, so he's... He's offered to make an introduction to a couple people Perfect. in areas that I might want to go into. So yeah. here's the deal. You're already way ahead of the rest of the candidates because he's got some credibility, obviously, over there. So they're going to hear good things about you before the interview. So I would keep it simple. This is a very stressed out uh, environment for a lot of people to do an interview. So the key is, is to prepare, prepare, prepare. They've done some research. I read some research recently that uh, the brain will retain 70% of what's in it, even under the most stressful environment. So uh, I've got a little phrase that I tell people, a relentless preparation leads to reflexive performance. And it's just like these quarterbacks that perform under pressure in the two minute drills. They've watched the film. They've practiced the two minute drill. The plays are going to run over and over and over again. And we've got a free interview guide called how to win the interview at KenColeman.com. I'll make sure that Kelly gets it to you. It's absolutely free. And we go through specific questions uh, that we know from research that hiring managers tend to ask. And then I teach you how to ask questions. And this would be the advice I'd give. The most important part of the interview, Rick, how do you put your best foot forward? Is by asking really good questions in the interview. A big mistake that people make is they feel like it's a one-way conversation that you're just answering questions. But there's going to be time for you to be able to return the serve and asking questions like, what kind of person wins in this organization? What do you love most about the culture here? What's your leadership style? Things like that. We give you more examples uh, in this free guide, but that's how you stand out, Rick, because you look prepared, you look insightful, and, and you also are showing enthusiasm by asking those kinds of questions. That's how you stand out. Many times by the questions that you ask. Yeah, and, it, you know, just if you kind of think about it, it's not like some kind of technique. No. The yeah. biggest technique here is to just – Flip the uh, moccasins for just a second. Walk them, walk them out on the other guy's yeah. moccasins. Let's pretend you were interviewing someone. Do you want to interview a wet dish rag who only responds yes or no when you ask a question? No, because that's what they're going to be when they work for yeah. you is a wet dish rag, right? And they they're no, bring no energy, no creativity, no add value to the thing. Mm -hmm. So if you're interviewing and you're hiring someone, what do you want them to be? Well, I want to see some energy, yeah. some enthusiasm. Some uh, ability to think on your feet. I want a little bit of intelligence here. Hello. Yeah. And um, and and I want to know by the way you're handling yourself that you're there for what you can bring yes. rather than what you can take. Yes. And 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 so I, I love questions. I mean, I, I I don't know the techniques and all this stuff. Uh, they've got all these interview techniques. How do you match two? How do you match uh, three different unmatching socks in the dark and all this BS? <laughs> try to figure out people's thinking skills or whatever. But I just like to you know I, yeah. I, if, if you were interviewing someone and you were getting ready to give them your money to work for you yeah and it's money that you don't have anymore because you gave it to them mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah then you want to hear them to say things like uh if i were here how could i add the most value yeah to this company or this organization and like you said, what do people that work that work out here that that are your best ones, the ones that win? What do they look like and yes. sound like? Yes. And I wonder if I'm one of those. That's right. And, and so, not like how you know, what's your work hours? Yeah. How many holidays do you take off? How, how much time do I get off? <laughs> Yeah, and you know, it's I'm going to help you. You're already off. Right, yeah, thank you. We're done with that. Well, this interview's yeah. over. Because yeah. all you're trying to figure out is what you can take rather yes. than what you can add. And sp to your point, speaking intelligently about the position, because you've done your homework on the company, about the product, about the service that they're about, and you know the job description so well that instinctively you're going, well, listen, I this is what you're looking for, and I bring these particular talents to the table. I'm a good fit here because of this skill and because of this experience. It's the ability to weave yourself, and to your point, 
point, Dave. How do you add value? Because we know from research that the number one thing hiring managers are looking for in the interview is, will this person help me win? Now, that doesn't sound, that's not selfish. It's just, duh. But that's what they're looking for. And you got to be the candidate. They go, that's who I want to give the ball to because I think they're going to help us win. Yeah. And that's what it's about. Put me so, in, coach. I'll leave yeah. it all on the field. So preparing to the point that you're not going to have your nerves take over. That's yeah. where people get tripped up. They didn't prepare. They kind of go in and they're shooting from the hip. So then when they when the anxiety hits and the stress hits. Then they say something really well, weird. Well, the brain can freak out on you. Yeah, when it, you say something like, like <laughs> just that, that becomes legendarily bad. Oh, you know? yeah, you end up on a website. I was interviewing this time, this time and he said so-and-so. <laughs> You'll be one of those guys, right? Yeah, right. So... <laughs> Yeah, yeah that, that website. Worst interviews I've oh, ever been on. Yeah, it's yeah, legendary. And the same thing's true if you are the interviewer. Oh, this is so many leaders blow it on the front end. They don't do a good job interviewing, and no wonder they get duped. And somebody will just lie right to them. It's an acting job. They don't know who they've hired yep. because they don't prepare. Um, we do a whole we do a whole lesson on that at Entree Leadership. It's called the intentional interview. You've got to know what you're looking for so you know what to ask. I mean, it's it's extraordinary. We don't have time to unpack it, but the amount of lost money through productivity and just replacement costs for small businesses and even large businesses is all about the hiring process. So it's it's. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. We at Ramsey Solutions, we're working on that. We're diving always, in. Always, always. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Kim is in Minneapolis. Hi, Kim. How can we help? Hi. It's so nice to talk to you all. You too. Well, I've got a quick one. Um, I uh, sold a classic car, and I have about $23,000, and I don't. we don't owe anything except our mortgage, and we have about, I'm 58 years old, $800,000 in our investments. So do I put it toward the investments or the house? What do you owe on the home? About 190 and it's worth about 560 Good for you. Okay. Well, you've done very, very well. Well, um, we teach folks to be putting 15% of your income away once you're debt-free other than the home and have an emergency fund of three to six months right. of expenses. I'm assuming you've done all of that. Right. And then we say beyond that, make sure kids' college is funded. I'm guessing you've probably done all that. And beyond that, the next goal is to pay off the house. And so I'm okay. leaning into this house as hard as I can. I'm not putting more than 15% of your income away. You've got a nice nest egg. And so you need to get this house knocked out. should be your next big goal. I'm curious. Oh, I, I don't usually know. get a lady calling me. Now, this is sexist, I know. Oh. <laughs> but I just don't usually get a lady calling me saying she sold her classic car. Usually that's a guy, yep. and he's somewhat sobbing <laughs> as he's discussing selling right. his classic car. So what's the story here? Well, the story is that it was my brother's, and my brother passed away, oh. and it's a 73 Datsun 240Z, and I have had it since probably 85. Wow. And, um, and you kept it I just for, it. you kept it because you love the car or nostalgia with your brother? Mostly. It is a really cute little car. Yeah. But my brother, but in Minneapolis, driving around in a Datsun 240Z nine months of the year is probably not very doable. Yeah. And I don't want it in the salt. Yeah, yeah. And so pretty much it's steamed all the time. Yeah, so it, it kind of used up its usefulness for nostalgia and or enjoyment. Correct. Time to move on and get your 23000 Look at you. Okay. Well, thanks for letting me ask that because it, it might be offensive to ask it, but I was just curious because I didn't see that coming. Did you? I did. I yeah. did. Yeah, there you go. That's cool. Good for you. Well done, Kim. This is The Ramsey Show.
lobby of Ramsey Solutions. On the debt-free stage, Jared and Christina are with us. Hey, guys, how are you? Hey, Dave. Hi. Welcome, welcome. Where do you guys live? Glendale, Arizona. All right. Welcome to Nashville. And all the way over here to do a debt-free scream, how much have you paid off? 168000 over six years. Six years. Wow. Okay. And your range of income during that time? About 100 to 130. Okay, cool. Good for you. And even more now. All right, good, good. What do you guys do for a living? I'm an engineer. Mm -hmm. And I'm a registered dietitian. Oh, wonderful. Okay, good to have you guys. What kind of debt was the 168,000? It was our mortgage. You paid off your house. (laughs) Look at it, weird people. (laughs) All right, excellent job. Way to go. How old are you two? I'm 35. I'm 32. And you have a paid-for house. We sure do. In Glendale, Arizona. What's this house worth? Uh, but the market now, it's about 450 Yeah, I guess. Wow. I like it. That feels good, doesn't it? Wow, sure does. look at you weirdo. <laughs> you guys are awesome, man. Way to go. So you said 35 and... 32. 35 and 32. Wow. That is so cool. All right, tell me the story. What happened in your 20s? Well... So I have to like poke fun at him for just a second because when we first got married, our church was offering an FPU class and I was like, hey, I think we should do this. My brother and sister-in-law have followed your plan and they're a preacher and a teacher. And so I was like, if they can make ends meet following the system, we should do this. Yeah. And he was like, no, <laughs> I am not cutting up my credit cards. I don't need to do that. That's like hokum. Um, but by the time, before we even finished the class, Oh, you um, did do the class. We did. We I convinced him. We did oh. it. And before we even had finished, he See, actually... That, now, you know, Jared, that's the way I would have gone into the class. <laughs> like, this guy's some kind of snake oil salesman. This grifter, what's he doing? I would have had my shields, my cynical butt, and I've got this gift of cynicism. I, I would have been just like you. <laughs> Pretty much. But he ended up picking up a second job, actually, getting up at like 3 o'clock in the morning to wow. work for FedEx for a couple wow. hours before he went to his big boy job. Wow. Um, to pay off his student loans. You and went so, all the way to the dark side. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure did. How much did you pay off on the student loans? They were just uh, about 19000 But you just knocked them out fast. Yep. Wow. Within a year of that class. Wow. Wow. Okay. This is so interesting. Okay. So you go to the class. Your brother-in-law and sister-in-law were in there. They're teachers. You're an engineer. I mean, you're good with numbers. Yes, sir. So that adds to the arrogance of this, obviously. <laughs> it's what I would have done. It's exactly what I would have done. I don't need this guy. I can add. I'm going to pay a guy to tell me how to handle money. That's crazy. <laughs> that would have been exactly what I would have been saying. All you people out there that make fun of me and say that, I'm just like you. So that's so fun. So uh, you go really against your will just to please your wife because you love your wife. Yep. And you go in there kind of with your... Like your arms crossed, right? Yeah, that's what. Now yeah, this is me. So, uh, what happened in the class? What changed you? Uh, I think you just convinced me that this way was the better way to win with money, and not the way I was going. So, I liked what you presented, and I was like, "Let's do this. Let's save up money and buy a house. Let's save up money and retire early. Let's let's live the goals and dreams we want to live." Wow. He makes that sound too simple. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, <laughs> yeah. we went from the arms crossed to. You just yeah. convinced me. Yeah, and I'm going to get up at 3 in the morning. I'm going to work two jobs. That's, I'm a morning person. It's yeah, okay. <laughs> He's a hard working no, dude. No, yeah, hard you got dude. ethic. But you, there was drive. What drove you to go that intense? I mean, you, you, you know what I mean? You really went quick. That's a good question. I think it's just seeing what debt really was and understanding that I was owing them that money and I had to pay it every month and just being able to see freedom and feel freedom it's that's what really motivated yeah. me that's yeah, you're, really. you're, you're a rip the band-aid off guy yeah yeah so he once he's in he's all in yeah i think he, there was blue face paint some william wallace braveheart <laughs> like you got angry <laughs> at it. yeah you got yeah. angry that's passion that's awesome that's so cool very good <laughs> very good so um uh for our listeners sake i am curious for because again i i'm i'm we're poking at this, but the uh, the way our minds work is similar. What was what happened in there uh, for you? What what lens were you looking at it through? The spiritual lens, the math lens, the process lens. What was it that when you saw that you went, oh, maybe, and then yeah. 
You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I'm curious what happened inside your brain. I think it's some of both math and spiritual. Math, yes. I hadn't been presented that information like you had presented it mm -hmm. to do that. And I didn't understand how practical it was that we could win with mm -hmm. money and mm -hmm. make that much progress and mm -hmm. be where we are today. So I was just kind of floating along and seeing the math that I could do that, I could save up money to oh, pay it for my good. house and okay. pay it off. And okay. that, you know, that really clicked with me. Well, thank you. Thank you for letting me delve into that. I apologize. Because I know I, you're the hero of the story, but it's a, a process that used you to get there. That's so cool. Well done, guys. Well done. All right. Now you've done it. You're not even 40. You have a half a million dollar house almost paid for. Uh, no debt in the whole freaking world, and you make 100 to 130 during this time. Uh, what is the secret people want to know to getting out of debt? So, I told Jared that if you ask this, I get to answer this question. Okay, good. <laughs> because the secret is I made pennies and I married somebody who didn't make pennies. <laughs> and so that's the secret. Just marry somebody who can uh, help you. But no, the real secret, I think, is we, we just were, um, like, I think, guided, obviously, by your principles. Um, and so that we could always be on the same team. Um, we just knew. Like, we didn't have to ever question what decisions we were going to make or how we were going to make them. We were just on the same page. Um, we just we just knew the plan. So. And my answer was to marry a frugal wife. Ah, <laughs> both of you. Good, the good marriage it, points answers across the board. Made here. it easier. Yep. Yeah. It does help to make more. If, you, if you're trying to get out of the hole, the size of your shovel matters, you know, and so, you know, going and doing the, the FedEx thing and then also being diligent at work and seeing your household income come up over this time and getting those raises and so forth, that that's makes a big difference. Yeah, I, I'm just curious. Now you've got the house paid off. You guys are very, very young. What are you dreaming about now? What has changed now that you've kind of got this final debt out of the way? That changes every day. <laughs> We're, it's, what I love about it is we have the freedom of options. Yeah. So we've been talking about house upgrades or buy a vacation house or, you know, saving more for the kids and everything. It's just... We have the freedom to, and we're still deciding what we want to do. Oh, dreaming's a lot more fun now. It is. Yeah. It's a lot more real. <laughs> That's Way cool. Go, you guys. Well done. Well done. What was the hardest part of the journey for y'all? So I, I, we're, I don't know. That's, we we're very, very, very blessed. And we really don't feel like there was a super, super hard part of the journey for us. Because again, like we were, we're naturally frugal people. We're naturally logical people. So, you know, if we don't want to have debt, then we don't buy things we can't afford. And Whoa! So, like, I know. Can you run for Congress? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So I think there was a lot of things like we obviously were very diligent and, um, living within our means but yeah. also just very very fortunate well you brought the kiddos with you what are their names and ages let's get them in the shot here we have kinsley who's eight mm -hmm. eden who's five mm -hmm. and the maniacal meyer who's almost two all right go meyer i love it all right a hundred and we got a copy of the legacy journey for you that's the next chapter in your story you have changed your legacy copy of the total money makeover for you to give away and hopefully someone will see the logic in that when you do that for them so thank you guys so much we're so proud of you guys absolute rock stars heroes well done look at that great family jared christina Kinsley, Eden, and Meyer from Glendale, Arizona. 168,000 paid off in six years, making 100 to 130. Count it down. House and everything. Let's hear a debt free scream. Three, two, two one. one. We're, We're debt free. <laughs> Love it. Well done, you guys. Very well done. Man. This is The Ramsey Show.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. He is the author of the number one best-selling book, The Proximity Principle, and a brand new book that's on pre-sale right now, From Paycheck to Purpose, The Clear Path to Doing Work you love from paycheck to purpose the clear path to doing work you love he is uh you can pick that book up at ramseysolutions.com at a deal be sure and check it out during the month of august we're also giving away free money on the website no purchase necessary so you need to go in and sign up for the giveaway of the free money and august is almost over uh we've noticed that one thing everyone has done with distractions of summer that they're ready to kick things into high gear we call it the second new year september 1st everybody's back Back in gear again, and as August comes to a close, you need to get ready to t- come into the fall ready to roll. And uh, we're running our $10 special on a whole lot of things right now. And today's deal is our family favorite uh, adventure pack. Our team is marking down to only $45.99, lowest price of the year. Check it out on check out daily for new deals, and always check out Ramsey Solutions. Com. And always, again, for the Ramsey Cash giveaway, you can text CASH to 33789. Text CASH to 33789. Catherine is in uh, Springfield, Missouri. Hi, Catherine. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, What's up? And also, I just want to thank you for your show because I find it very encouraging. I'm not one of the smart people or the big money earners. But I am single and um, dependent only on myself, and it's just been very encouraging to me to to hear your show and just keep plugging along. Well, we are honored to have you, and you're among friends because Ken and I are not one of the smart people either. (laughs) Especially me. Emphasis on Ken. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hey, we, you know, yeah. hey, I, lo- I love uh, slightly above average students who go out and become successful. And that's yes. me and you, that's the three of us. How can we help today? Well, I have gotten two credit card companies that have sent me new cards. They're identical to the old card, only they include the tap to pay. And I'm tempted to destroy the new ones since they're identical. But I'm just wondering, is is there a reason I should keep the tap to pay? Well, tap to pay in and of itself is not um, bad. Of course, we teach people to only use debit cards. I don't right. have I don't have any credit cards. I have debit cards, and debit cards today, um, almost all of them have a chip in them. And that's, right. all, that's all come about in really the last four years or so in the U.S. It was widespread in Europe before it was here. But most of our debit and credit cards now have a chip. And so when you, uh, for instance, I'm buying gas this morning and I put it into the, uh, the gas pump, it, it identifies with a chip that it is a debit card. It, it, doesn't, it used to have to ask me. If it was a debit or credit, now it identifies it and tells me to put in my pin. Um, and I'll, matter of fact, a lot of the credit cards now have you put in a pin as well on a pay on a point of sale transfer because they're trying to do that to avoid uh, fraud and so forth. But uh, the biggest thing you want to remember with all these products is just the easier they make the transaction to occur, the more you buy. Right. And that's the only thing. As long as you know that, as long as you know that and you're guard against it, you know, it's like Amazon Prime. It's a very easy transaction. You can just sit there and push that little button all day and crap will show up on your front porch, you know. It's just it's just (laughs) really, really easy. And you tend to spend more the easier it is to do the transaction. The harder, more cumbersome the transaction, marketers call that friction, uh, then the, the more it slows you down and makes you realize you're actually doing a transaction, you're actually giving someone money. So as long as you're aware of that, I don't care if you use Apple Pay, I don't care if you wave a wand and do a dance. I, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of different ways to pay for things these days, but all of them just about are trying to make it easier and easier and easier to do the transaction because all the merchants know that consumers spend more that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mine usually stay in the drawer, but I have my house on the market right now. 
So my realtor said, don't leave things in the drawer. So I have to keep them in my purse. And I'm wondering, is it safe to keep these in my purse? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're fine because it's got fraud protection on it. If they got stolen, you just turn it in for fraud. You're not, you're not responsible for transactions on a thefted credit card. Uh, now, if somebody took it out and used it and put it back, it might be a little while before you realized it when you got the statement or something. But um, but that would be true of a debit card or anything else. And again, we tell you to not use credit cards at all. Uh, a debit card will do everything a credit card will do except put you into debt. It has the exact same protections for fraud. The exact It's just as safe. I still see stupid people on the Internet say, oh, I, got, I don't have to carry a debit card. It's not safe. It's just exactly as safe as your credit card. If, if you misuse your credit card, you get to pay for it. If someone misuses your credit card for you, call fraud or theft, you don't have to pay for it. Same is true with a debit card. It's all exactly the same, Ken. Yeah, it it is, and there's just this myth out there, and I think that's uh, you think the credit card companies are behind all that, Dave. I I suspect maybe they are. Well, yeah. urban legends out there. Sure, they don't. You know, of course. If you go to we, if you go to Visa or Mastercard's website, you'll see it. It's a zero liability that's policy exactly on right. both their sites. For both products, yes. debit or yes. credit, either one. And our bank protects us, Dave. If I go to another city in the country and I, I find I'll tell them ahead of time, they'll stop purchases as a protection. That's a and wonderful thing. And they'll do that thing. on credit or debit. Yes, they will. Because they are liable for yes. the fa- That's fraudulent right. transactions. Jacob is in Carthage, Texas. Hi, Jacob. How are you? Man, I'm doing great to talk to you, Dave and Ken. Hey, man. What's up? I am 26. Uh, my wife and I are in baby steps four, five, and six. And uh, thanks to your plan, and um, because of that, I am chasing my dream of being self-employed. Cool. Um, but I'm finding really finding it really difficult to balance working my side hustle because my full-time job, being a dad, being a husband, being involved in my church, it's like I'm starving my side hustle and I'm never giving it. I don't know if I'm ever going to give it enough to, for it to prove itself. What is it? What are you doing? I don't know. I make handmade bass lures that sell for, you know, over a hundred dollars a piece. And um, what's your margin on this? uh, Almost nothing on material. Yeah. What's Uh, the time? What's it take to produce one time wise? As of right now, because I'm so small scale, I have like one day that I get to work on them a week, and I can I can turn one out in a couple hours. Okay. I haven't really. I, there are ways. So if you sell it for a hundred bucks, further. your material costs is almost nothing, and it took two hours. You're making fifty dollars an hour. Correct. Yeah. And the faster I can do it, the more money I can make. And I'm and I'm going to work on investing in some better production um, practices to yeah. help me turn out more yeah, i was gonna say i would be patient on this because you got a lot going on in your life right now but you know this, this is going to be a math equation you know at some point once you can get this thing up and going no matter how long it takes uh and it replaces your day job income with where you're at in baby steps four five and six that's when you do it but you're gonna eventually gonna have to not only figure out the the production issues but then train people and slowly grow this thing so you're gonna have to be patient regardless that's what i'm kind of telling you but i wouldn't quit on it just because you're in a season right now where you have limited time but i would and, be patient and here's the thing you need to just sit down with a calendar mm-hmm. and choose yeah. what you're going to do with your time and then yeah. be satisfied with your cho- and then be for... satisfied with your choice yeah, yeah. no guilt i'll be looking for new employment no uh, I mean, not necessarily me more time no not necessarily so um here, here's the thing um christy wright says in her new book it's, it's a beautiful line she says balance is not doing everything equally balance is doing the right thing yes. at the right time and for this season of your life for the next 12 months what is the right thing to do with your time? There's not a right or wrong answer. It's what do you want to do with it? And uh, so if you want to be on fewer church committees and make more bass lures, that's okay. That's the, that could be the right thing for you. And you just got to lay that out and decide which one is which. For now. And it doesn't have to be permanent. But for now, this is The Ramsey Show. It's Kelly, associate producer for The Ramsey Show. This episode is over, but if you heard about an event, product, or service and didn't have a chance to write it down, don't worry. We list everything you've heard about during this episode in the podcast show notes section or head to theramseyshow.com. Thanks for listening. This is 
The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, is my co-host today as we talk to you about your career, your life, your money, Whatever it is you want to talk about, we're here for you. The phone number, 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. John is with us to start off this hour in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hi, John. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave. Thanks for having me. Sure. What's up? Good to, good to talk to you today. You um, too. We, I, I'm in a bit of a mess. I've I moved for I moved from uh, Texas in January and uh, of 2021 this year, and this is the first time we've moved out away from from everyone. Um, it's the first time we had left the city that we 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 spent our whole lives in, and so we took a big leap of faith and got out here to Tulsa, and um, we just really really kind of gotten ourselves in a bind. Uh, I was, I was listening to you hard and heavy for about three months straight before we, before we moved and we had big, big plans to sit down and talk through some things and figure some stuff out. And we didn't, and I made a lot of dumb decisions since then. And we are in all kinds of debt. Uh, we've got from credit cards to loans, to student loans, car payments, um, and we're just in over our heads so so deep that we're trying to figure out what to do, you know. Hmm. So if you were completely free, would you move back home? I don't think so. Okay. So what is the it was just the stress of being away from what was uh familiar you think that added to the bad decisions is that why you're telling us about that part of it i yes definitely i do believe so there was there's a lot of uh with my wife and i we 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 let we we pastored for several years and for five years and and so we were out of ministry for one year and we we fully believe god spoke to us to move to tulsa Mm mm-hmm so we did you take know. did you take another pastor right there? No, I did not. Um I'm also a plumber. I've I've I'm a I've got a master license in Texas. I have a business there still that generates a little bit of money. Um and I've worked for a plumbing company here in, in this area. Um my wife is not working right now, but she's she's about to go back to work and so that's gonna help us a lot, I know. Okay, um, what do you we, make now? Probably about I make about seventy eight with with one the one company probably okay. close to a hundred combined. Okay. And what does she what will she make? Um, we'll probably be in the hundred I would say hundred to one hundred and twenty range together combined. All right, I'm going to call it one hundred and twenty because you told me a hundred before you said she went back to work. All right, so yeah. um, now uh, how much is your house payment? It's fourteen fifty a month. Okay, and what do you owe on the cars? Each, um, each. Now, okay, forty two thousand on one. Mm-hmm. And I took out a loan, a person, a couple of personal loans, and one of them is tied to my truck now, and so that one the total is about twelve thousand. Mm-hmm. Okay, and you already had student loans before you moved. Yes. And how much are the they? the student? The student loans they equal about sixty thousand. Did you say each? Uh, they they're about they total about they total 60, about sixty. Okay, so forty two, twelve, and sixty. What other debts? Um, oh, credit cards. The more loans. Uh, credit cards are probably about eight thousand. Mm hmm. Okay. Um, somewhere in there, maybe a little less. Loans are around twenty thousand. Just personal loans. 
Yes. Okay. So how much of this did you do since you moved? Um, the, the student loans and one car were previous, the big car. That was all previous. About half of the credit cards were previous. The new loans and credit card debt is since we moved. Okay. So how can I best help you? We're, I just I don't even know we're we're just such at, at such a loss right now and and there was a lot of bad decisions like I said that that combined us together making dumb dumb things and we we finally got back to church um, we just I'm wondering if there's like a group here in Tulsa that we can find that that is a Ramsey group sure. is there a way to find that Sure we'll just put you into uh, Ramsey Plus and a um you know, Financial Peace University, and all, there's a lot of churches teaching that live, and you can plug into that. I'll pay for that and help you get started. Um, okay, the, the, your your language covers the, the words you're using and the way you're using them covers a lot of other mistakes that aren't financial. It sounds like. Yeah, there there has been. Okay, there's that, been some different. Yeah. Okay, let's just leave that there because it's the weight of okay. this doesn't the weight of this in your voice doesn't really match your numbers. That's why I was asking. So um, so what if I said, uh, okay, yeah. we're going to get really together. Uh, you and your wife are going to work tight together. You're going to be on beans and rice, rice and beans. You're not going to see the inside of a restaurant unless you work there, and you're not going on vacation, and you're selling her stupid butt $42,000 car. What if I said that? That that's I, we're we're on board. We're we're ready. We we're both ready, but we've just been talking about it, and we, we're ready to do it now. Yeah, yeah you got you got to start doing today. some stuff that's going to hurt. Yeah, there's some pain involved in living like no one else, so that later you can live and give like no one else. And 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 we're ready. Yeah, we just need some help to get started. I believe. And okay, you gonna you gonna sell a bunch of crap, and you're gonna cut your lifestyle to nothing. Yeah, okay. you you've been you've been eating candy so much, you got a stomach ache. What it amounts to? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, yes. like I take one of my grandkids to the ice cream store and let them just, you know, completely founder themselves, and then they're on a sugar high and their belly hurts, right? Yes. And I, you know what, I, John, I'm, I'm just going to say this. I'm not going to make you respond to it, but I think it's time for you and your wife to forgive yourselves. There's some shame. There's some pain that's driving some of these decisions. At some point, you're going to have to say, God still loves us. We still have a lot of value to ourselves, to our family, to our friends, and to him. You need to forgive yourself and, and, and move forward today. Yeah. Plumbers are as today. valuable to the kingdom of God as preachers are. Yeah. Well, And you don't have to be a preacher for God to love you. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure God might love some plumbers more than some preachers. <laughs> I can attest to that, Dave, from uh, personal experience. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I'm kidding. Not really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hang on, buddy. Uh, Kelly will pick up. We'll get you signed up for financial peace. You jump in there and go change your life. You're, you're ready. You are definitely ready. I hope she is. It's going to be a rough ride for the next 14 months. This is The Ramsey Show. We were drawn to Christian Healthcare Ministries because we both had young families and we wanted to have more children. And we had also just started a real estate company and needed to find healthcare coverage that would meet our needs. We were attracted to CHM because of its low monthly costs and the ability to negotiate medical costs down. Established in 1981 and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, CHM is here to meet the needs of your growing family or small business. Check us out at chministries.org backslash budget. We absolutely believe in it. Coleman Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Danielle is with us. Danielle is in Germantown, Maryland. Hi, Danielle. How are you? Hi, Mr. Ramsey. I'm doing well. How are you today? Better than I deserve. What's up? 
And hi, Mr. Coleman. Um, I want to say, uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to talk to you guys. And I want to also say a huge thank you to you, uh, Mr. Ramsey, because of you and your principles, not only have my husband and I been able to um, pay off debt and, you know, with a lot of hard work and a literal prayer miracle, um, we were able to pay off our debt and be debt free six months early. Yay! And that's also- Thanks. And that's also freed me to um, pursue, you know, this God-given call that I have to um, open a Christian school right outside of our nation's capital. So I'm really excited about all of that. Cool. Wow. Which leads me to my question slash problem. Um, Last week I was listening and you told um, a young lady that you really want to rewrite this narrative that um, in order to do righteous work, you have to be broke. And I completely agree. I feel like you shouldn't have to be. Um, But the problem that I see, particularly for uh, private schools and especially Christian schools, is that there's a revenue problem. Um, Most Christian schools, most private schools rely almost 100 percent on tuition. And um, that poses a problem because you can't pay teachers what they deserve to be paid. Um, Ken, I think you said the national average is about 60000 and I know in many schools, um, teachers in private schools, especially Christian schools, are getting paid less than that. And in order to pay them more, you typically have to hike up tuition, but then that's breaking the backs of the people that you truly want to serve. And so I just wanted to know, what are your thoughts on how we can fix this problem and rewrite this narrative, because I 100% agree with you. I just can't think of the solution. How old is the school, and how many students do you have? So um, it is, It's an. I'm actually in an interesting situation. I am just joining the school. The school has been running for 21 years. It's a niche school for um, students with learning differences from uh, 6th grade through 12th grade, and the hope is to grow that um, ultimately from preschool to 12th grade in the coming years. Okay. And what's the uh, t- cost of tuition right now for 6 to 12? Approximately um, $20,000 a year. Yeah. So if you were going to pay teachers more, have you run a model out as to how that would affect your tuition? So I have not, honestly. Um, this miracle kind of just happened where I'm just now starting with this job. But I will say that um, from our what I know of our finances right now, most of that goes towards teacher salaries. And um, and the reason that the tuition is what it is, is that um, to cover those things, but we tend to not, when you include Jesus in a lot of things, you don't get to, uh, you don't really qualify for um, a lot of the grants or other things sure. that you've done, but I have not. Okay. So first thing, first thing, I think you got to run the model. Okay. Cause you got to okay. really see, all right, if, if we were to raise uh, the salaries of our teachers by X amount of dollars, you just run the numbers and then you okay. got to play that out. You got to know what you're dealing with first. The second thing I would recommend is that I think, uh, and by the way, I'm very, very drawn to your mission. Uh, I have a child that, that requires some special uh, education services and I love what you're doing. And these families uh, almost come to this school almost as a last resort. It's a, it's a real oasis, yeah. I'm guessing. And yeah, yeah so a couple things you got going on there. Um, because of the demand of that, uh, I think you've got to look at separate fundraising. I think you've got to really come up with a model where we're going to we're gonna offset tuition by we're going to get really serious about uh, raising money. And that you're going to get to some high net worth individuals. That's going to take some time. But I think that's got to be a strategy long term. <laughs> and then um, I would also tell you that uh, – Part of this is uh, is opening up more space, if you can do that. When you get more kids, then it kind of scales out. So there's really no silver bullet okay. answer. But okay. um, I think that if you can make the case over time and you're winning for these families and it doesn't get too ridiculous, um, I think with those three strategies, you can get those salaries up uh, into at least the average in your area. How, how many teachers do you have? Um we have about six teachers. Some of them are part-time, some are full-time. Six teachers? Yes. And how many students? And even for me, I'm the vice president. Right now we have like 22 kids. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. I thought uh, it was much larger than that. Okay. No, we're, we're at 22, pretty small. Okay. Um, and so if you raise the six teachers $10,000, that would be $60,000. Mm-hmm. Uh, divided by 22 would yeah. be $3,000 a piece. That's the model he's talking about. Okay. And then you say, oh, wait, we're going to raise it $5,000 because we have some kids we want a scholarship. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's there are a few that are on a financial assistance. And there'll be a few more 
because you're bumping it from 20 to 25. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and and you're going to raise your, but that's an example of how you'd model the math out um, of how to play into it and to decide uh, from there. Um, You probably, and again, the type of care and what you're plugged into, I don't know. I'm not an expert on that world. Just from a business viewpoint, though, uh, having run stuff with six people or 60 people, uh, having run stuff with now a 1,000 people on our team, um, you will get some economies of scale that will help your situation as well if, for instance, you could double your enrollment and double your teaching staff. Yeah. Now, you're not going to do that in 20 minutes. But over time, if you had 50 students instead of 25, things are going to work a lot easier. Because right now, every single check that is written by a student for tuition, by a parent for tuition, uh, is, a, is a backbreaker if it doesn't come in. Because you you, you're spread across so few people. And so your risk, your volatility is a much higher on a percentage basis. Everyone is living more by the thre- by a thread rather than there's no wiggle room, which as you get a little bit more scale, you've got a little bit more margin, a little bit more slosh that you can do and, and still still be responsible with your salaries and with your other. But I think a combination between uh, some students are going to get served by the higher tuition with scholarships because we now have room to do that. Um, and some are going to get served with um, by lowering the, the net cost of the tuition by uh, fundraising, like Ken's saying, um, but all the while keeping the fact that this mission is vital and really matters. Yeah. And I think that's the whole thing you aim at, is, is to go those directions. There's yes. a lot going on here, but um, it, it truly is more difficult to run a 22-person thing than a fifty-person thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and, and again, I, I I think if you can get some quality businesses who understand the vision and the mission of the organization, and they help with that scholarship fund, you can get that thing going. You know, and 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 really begin to create almost a miniature endowment too. I mean, yeah. you've not a whole lot of effort here. And here's what's interesting: it doesn't take but one or two of those. That's exactly right. Deep pockets and a person like her. She's just the Hard person to say for the no job. To. She's just the person I for the agree. job. I agree. <laughs> she just she just oozes this stuff. It's yeah. perfect. Yeah. I mean, Danielle, you're you're amazing. I'm proud of you. Yeah. You get after it, kiddo. Get after it. Hey, let me ask you a quick follow up on that, Dave, because I, I don't know the answer to this. If if she were to go raise, let's just say a hundred or two hundred thousand, what would that? What fund could they put that in to be able to let that to start to earn, just like it would for an individual, to where maybe that self funds three or four kids every year. You can sit down. Some of our smart just Mr. one of our smart our smart pros. pros does endowment funding, and so okay. and what you want to do is just go on the conservative side, but not so conservative right. that it's earning no money. But um, you know, I'll give you an example. All right? If you had a quarter of a million dollars laying there at ten percent, that's twenty five thousand. Yeah, every year. Yeah, forever. Yeah, exactly. So every two hundred fifty thousand you raise and, and put into an endowment fund sends a kid free forever. Yeah. As an example. Right. Yes. That's what endowment means. That's how yeah. an endowment works at these colleges and some of these universities that are sending all the kids home because they're not yeah. vaccinated or sending them home because of COVID or sending them home have a billion dollars sitting in an endowment fund. Oh, we're getting ready to see some upheaval there, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Higher education, you are up a creek. You got some problems coming your way, the way some of y'all are acting. It's getting ready to be a mess. Getting ready to be a mess. I was a little bit, I thought it was going to be a little while longer, but it looks like COVID is going to hasten it. Wow. This is the Ramsey Show. struggling with money 
It's easy to tell yourself that you'll deal with it later or that you'll start fresh at the new year. But then later rolls around and you're still stressed. You're still out of control. Don't wait. You need to start right now. Decide right now that this is the last month you will ever worry about money. If you make that decision, we want to help. And that's why for this month only, just for a little while longer here in August, we're knocking $30 off a 12-month membership to our most impactful, life-changing money products. With a Ramsey Plus membership, you get access to Financial Peace University. It's our step-by-step plan to save money, pay off debt, build wealth, be outrageously generous. And you get the premium version of the budgeting tool, Every Dollar, which is the world's best budgeting tool. And it'll help you put your plan into action. Financial Peace University and Every Dollar have helped millions and millions and millions of families, literally. You deserve a life free of monthly payments and money stress. Call for a free trial. Start for a text for a free trial of Ramsey Plus by texting TRIAL to 337789. 33789. Text TRIAL to 33789 for a free trial of Ramsey Plus. Jay is with us. Jay is in Las Vegas. Hi, Jay. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. It's great to be here. I'm pretty excited. Honored to have you. How can we help? My wife and I are looking towards buying a business, which is a gate installation company for HOA communities. And the appraisal for it's worth about 1.5, and it makes one to 200 a year from for the owners if they work in the business. It's not worth now, 1.5. We have, right. Well, we're having a second appraisal done by the bank that that's, uh, we're trying to get a loan from to see if we can have that, which is what we decided it's actually worth. But we're wondering if we should even go for that, or should we sell the properties that we have in order to pay cash? Okay. Jay, um, 30 years ago in my 20s, I went broke and lost everything I because I borrowed money to run a business. Um, it was partly because I was stupid, but it's partly because debt increases risk and the borrower is slave to the lender. So since I've been on the radio in the last 30 years, I've never told someone to borrow money on anything except I don't yell at you for doing it on a house. But I've never told someone to borrow money to buy a business ever in 30 years. So um, that's that, that's probably information you didn't know when you called. But um, just to kind of let you know where I'm coming from so that you, you have a fair understanding. So where I – and I don't borrow money. I don't have a dime of debt, and I haven't in decades. Consequently, I make a lot of money, and I keep all of it except taxes and generosity. And so I've been able to build inordinate amounts of wealth because I don't give it all to some stupid butt bank and I don't lose money and lose entire segments of business every time there's a problem. Because if there's a pandemic or something like that and people quit building gates to HOAs and you have a bank payment, the bank doesn't care. They still want their stinking payment because they're a stinking bank. And so I'm not going to tell you to go in debt to a stinking bank to buy an overpriced business. And this business is dramatically overpriced. We'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah. Okay. So if you have okay. the assets to sell and pay cash for the business, if I were in your shoes, that's the only way I could do the transaction. And I don't recommend people do things that I wouldn't do. This is a show about what I would do, what Ken would do in these situations, okay? So you're saying you have enough real estate to sell and you have the cash to buy the business, is that right? That's right. Yeah, and so you need to decide, do you want the business more or the real estate more? Now, here's a good rule of thumb. After all expenses are paid, including running the business, working in the business, if I were to buy this gate business and I don't live in Vegas, I would have to have someone run the business. Okay? You follow me? Yeah. So I want to look at the P&L as if that has happened. So what does it take to put a manager 
in the seat where this owner is working his own job. Now, after that manager is paid, whatever market rate to put that manager, that business manager in place, what am I going to make as an absentee investor as a return on my money? And that's the profit after a manager is paid. Do you agree with me? Do you understand? Yes, sir. This is what the business is worth, a multiple of that net profit. Otherwise, you're just buying a job. If you buy the jo- if you buy a business and the only income it makes is the wages that should have been paid to the guy running the business, you just bought a job. That's all you did. Don't do that. You don't you never buy a job. If you're going to work a job, go work for somebody, keep all your money in your pocket. Don't go buying the opportunity to make wages. You want to make a you want to make wages if you're working in the business and a return on your investment. So let's pretend that this business makes a hundred thousand dollars a year after the manager is paid, which isn't going to be far off. Okay. Okay. Now, if I want a twenty percent rate of return on my money as an investor, then I would divide the one hundred thousand by point two. Or multiplied by five, which is the same thing. That would make this business worth five hundred thousand dollars. Okay. If okay. I want a twenty-five percent rate of return on my money, which, by the way, this is a high-risk business. It's a high-risk thing, so I want a high rate of return on my money because it's a small business. The probability of failure is much higher than if I put money in mutual funds or real estate. Yeah. So if I want a 25% rate of return on my money, I divide by 0.25 or I multiply by 4, which means this business is worth four to 500000 if it's netting 100000 This thing ain't worth anywhere near 1.2, dude. Okay. <laughs> and I don't know who, I don't know who your appraiser that. is, but he ought to have his butt kicked up around his neck and wear it like a collar. <laughs> I'll, I'll let them know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jay, Jay's not getting it. You know, it's like the, people will tell you this, but it, this is how the real world works. Big time companies, they do the same basic formula. This is how you. This you, is you, mergers it's, and it's, acquisitions. It's a cap rate. That's right. On that operating income yeah. of the business. This is a standard valuation process. And so, how you get to a million two on this. I don't know what kind of dance this guy's doing with it. Uh, there's something going That's on. That's ten times revenue if it's even actually net one hundred thousand. Yeah, which we're not even hundred percent sure. Which means you're making ten percent on your money, right? I mean, and you can make more than that in mutual funds set at home. And I wonder how valuable the real estate is. Clearly, valuable enough to come up with one point five million. Is what he said. He said he had enough to be able to cover the one point five million dollar appraisal. Yeah, his real estate's making him more than this. So I think you gave him the right thing. What's more valuable to you? Because yeah. this is an expensive job. <laughs> yeah. be, be very careful here. There's a lot of warning signs in what you described to me. Unless I misunderstood something you were saying, which is possible. Sometimes I do, but I don't think I did. So, But I think he's going to go ahead and buy it anyway. Felt like it. Felt like... Uh Wants to hear that bank's appraisal, and the bank's got it. They they, they <laughs> want to juice that value. Let me tell you what, you I, tell you what I want from a bank: Zippo on an appraisal. I can tell you that an on a open, business, an open parking spot. <laughs> <laughs> when I get there, that's what I want from a I bank. Like that. That's good. I don't want a bank advising me on anything. Yeah. I don't want them advising me on my dad gum estate plan. I don't want their trust department handling my dad gum kids stuff when I'm gone. I just want their checking account to yes. balance and be where. I told him it was going to be. Yep. I don't need a banker's advice on investing for sure. Good Lord, they're a banker. Think about it. Jeez, they couldn't get a good job. Wow. This is The Ramsey Show.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Christina is in Ocala, Florida. Hi, Christina. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave and Ken. Thank you for taking my call. This is a wonderful birthday present. Oh, well, happy honor. birthday. Thank you. It's the big 4-0. It's kind of scary. Oh, <laughs> oh I don't know how you're going to make it, old woman. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what my husband said. Poor me. Um, I have a question because my husband and I have been working our baby steps, which is wonderful. And we're kind of concerned on how to deal with his father. <laughs> we want to handle it in a way that his retirement is going to be a blessing instead of a new curse for us. Um, let me give you a little background. He is a single man and has been since him and his mom divorced 40 years ago. He spent the last 20 years um, renting. He's never bought or owned a home. He, at one point, leased and owned three cars, a boat, jet ski, and two motorcycles. He's always had more than one car, and he's one person. Um, he's retired now. All he has is Social Security, a little bit of pension, and $100,000 to his name. And he thinks buying a gun is an investment. And we're just terrified that <laughs> we need to fit him into our baby steps because we're going to end up having to take care of him if we can't get him to stop wasting money. Okay. Um, what do you guys make a year? Uh, a hundred. 30,000. I, I work four jobs and run a business trying to clean up our own mess. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we have our own goals and dreams. And I just feel like one out of guilt, we're all he has. I mean, mm -hmm. my husband is his only son. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's nobody else that's going to take him in. It would have to be us. So I feel like if we could get him on the right path, he might be okay. But that's having to explain to him that, you know what, you're going to have to stop blowing money and maybe work a part-time job because he thinks he can buy a house, but that's going to take all his money if that's even enough. Mm -hmm. A hundred thousand dollars doesn't buy he? much. How old is he? 68. Mm -hmm. House is hell. Uh, well, he just had surgery for prostate cancer, but that all went well. So mm -hmm. we're hoping the health maintains, but that's my other concern. So if your that husband goes, has a good relationship with his dad? Oh, yeah. We've always been close with him, and we have a good relationship. And a couple of years ago, we sat down and talked to him about all this and kind of tried to explain to him making 8%. He's got some finance guy at his credit union telling him making 8% and whatever he has it in that he doesn't understand is good. We're like, no, <laughs> that's not good. And he thinks it is. And he doesn't understand half of what they're doing. They just He gives them his money, and they do whatever, and he thinks it's good. Mm -hmm. And after that many years of them doing whatever, all you have is $100,000 to show for it. I think you need a new guy. Mm -hmm. I think you're more upset about this than anybody else on the planet. Uh, well, it terrifies me. Yeah. I don't I think, you're, I don't think your husband's upset you. about it, and I don't think his dad's upset about it. Well, my husband's worried because he doesn't. Not as worried as you. The other day. Well, <laughs> I'm nervous to talk to you, too. But my husband's <laughs> like, I need to talk to him, but, you know, how do I talk to him without, you know, hurting his feelings or being kind of a jerk about it? Because, like, he's rented a house for 30 years paying $250 a month. No, well, I can just tell you, you don't need to talk to him. Because <sighs> your state of mind is not a state of mind that he's going to listen to you. Well, no, I won't talk to him. My husband yeah. has to. Yeah, your husband has to. He, <laughs> That's not my problem. <laughs> I know, I know, but it's um, you're you're because you're you're um, you have a lot of anxiety about this, and it's going to come through, and it's going to sound bossy to him, and you don't want that, and it won't be it won't be uh, profitable for the conversation. Your husband can sit down and talk to him, but I, I'll give you a prediction: your husband can sit down and talk to him, and probably nothing's going to change. Okay. Because I don't think the old man wants to change. I don't think he gives a rip. Right? So it, then and so he's 68 years old. He's 68 years old. He has $100,000. He buys guns. Um, and he pays his rent. And cars. Well, he just now found out he has to move out of that. So now he just went and dumped money to rent a trailer until he can figure out where he wants to live. Okay. On yeah. top of his... One of the most he, one of the most painful pain things pain. that we all go through as adults is watching people we care about be stupid. <laughs> yeah. 
Because you can't make them not be stupid. Everyone has people in their family and in their friend group that are doing things that we all look at them and go, oh, my, 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 my. And, you, you know, the, the only hope is, is that occasionally you can knock a knot on one of them's head and get their attention and turn them around. But I don't hear anything in this story that makes me think he's going to listen to your husband. Do you really think there's any scenario where your husband says any? I don't have any magic words for your husband to use. And I, I just don't think this old man really cares about. I think he's got his own way of doing things. And I don't think he uh, cares. So here's the thing. You make $130,000 a year, you can probably buy him a little bit of groceries if he's completely starving to death. You might even help him with his rent a little bit here or there a few times, even though he's been a complete twerp with money and doesn't really deserve, with his irresponsibility, the help. But you can afford to dump a little bit of money in that, and it, you're, it's not going to make you broke. You're not going to give this guy hundred okay. grand. Yeah. Nor do you have to pay off his debt. No. All those boats and cars, you can sell all that if something happens to him. Yeah, you're not responsible for any of that. Yeah. All we want to do is just make sure he's not hungry and homeless. Yeah. And well, that, yeah, that was kind of our point. Yeah, like, it do, it doesn't take a lot of money, though. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take a lot of money. If, if you're paying his rent, you decide where he lives. Or he doesn't okay. have to live there. I mean, I'm gonna get a little cheap, a little cheap uh, trailer or a little one bedroom apartment or something. Let him rent, and you can do that depending on where he is. A few hundred here or there, right? And uh, the same thing with groceries. So, and you guys can afford to do that. And by the time you have to do it, which will be many years from now, if you ever even do have to do it, your wealth is going to be on track because you're doing smart stuff. But okay. it's just, it's just. I agree with the pain in your voice. And the desperation in your voice, because it's just hard to watch people you care be self-destructive. Yeah, I mean. Well, yeah, when we feel like we're it, that we have to do No, something. you don't. You don't, yeah. You don't have that. to. You don't have to do anything. There's not a law that says, you've done cocaine your whole life, and now I'm supposed to pay for your rent. There's no, I mean. You've misbehaved, whatever form of misbehavior you want to come up with, your whole freaking 70 years on the planet, and you're and now I'm obligated to feed you? Not really, but I probably will just because yeah. I'm a compassionate person. <laughs> He's not going to yeah. take you guys down. You either have so much fear, for, and I get it. There's so much unknown, and you're in the middle of the struggle, and you guys are busting in your gazelle and tents, and you're working four jobs, and you're going, 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 going. But listen, he's not going to drag you down. He's not going to drag you guys down. So that fear needs to go away. But he's, it's disgusting to Sure, you of course. Because you're working so hard and he's not doing squat. Yeah. You know, you're being so responsible and he's so irresponsible. I get that. It's disgusting yeah, to me to hear him. about him and I don't even know him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get it. I, I understand. But he's, what is he? He's most of America, right? Yeah. And, and so he's irresponsible and slovenly and out of control and... You know, and, and then acts like somebody did something to him. And nobody did anything to this old guy. He just farted That's around with all true. his money till it was gone. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think you can calm and, and just lovingly. I mean, please don't talk to him. Let your husband. And it's his son. And just say, Dad, I'm going to knock a nod on your noggin if you don't quit this. Because I'm afraid I'm going to have to feed your butt because you're misbehaving. Now, you need to gr be a grown-up, and this is how he needs to talk to him. Because this whole guy doesn't do subtlety, does he? No. No, he needs a two, <laughs> no, he he needs a two before upside the head. And that's, that's what your son's going to have to do. But that's the only shot he's got getting through to him. And it's just lovingly, Dad, I love you, but you're being a butt. And you got to stop it. And you're just going to have to have this conversation and then see how it goes. Hallmark needs to make one of those cards. Right there. The Dave Ramsey. Dad, I love you, but you're being a butt. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that'll be a big seller. Be a big seller. It will. It'll be a big seller. It'll be a movie on Hallmark Channel. <laughs> <laughs> this is The Ramsey Show. This is James Childs, producer of The Ramsey Show. You can listen to all our shows with the Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. Browse by topic or even sync clips to your friends. Download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today. This is 
is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. That's 888 888- Eight two five five two two five. Rusty is in Odessa, Texas. Hey, Rusty, what's up? Hey, guys, how are you? Great, man. How can we help? You're doing well. Hey, I've been following your plan for about 20 years. Uh, we're on baby step seven. wanted to ask you a question about something that uh, we're starting to see is places that are no longer taking cash or basically penalizing those of us that are using cash, like uh, – entertainment places where you have to put cash on a on a plate card um and then if you don't use all of it you don't get it all back we're just curious your thoughts about that i'm not familiar with that type of transaction um uh you know i mean obviously there's situations where i just look as a matter of principle i choose not to do business with somebody by the way by the they, they are putting forth barriers to me they're requiring things of me as a customer uh maybe around covid or around cash or something that i don't want to do and therefore i don't do it and that means i can't be their customer and that's okay they own the business they're allowed to say that um as far as i know the whole legal tender thing won't work i mean they're supposed to accept legal tender that's the whole purpose of a currency but i don't know of anyone enforcing that at the federal level which is what it would have to be i guess so i, I think that's probably more of a philosophical discussion than anything else but sure. I, I carry a debit card so if i'm in a situation like that um unless the people are just being weird or something i right. I, I use a debit card to run a tab at a place or something if i need sure. to but i'm not going to give somebody cash it's non-refundable if i don't use it all Right. What is that like a club, like a nightclub thing? Yeah, it's like a it's uh like an entertainment that has like movies and bowling alleys and game rooms and things like that. Oh, okay. yeah, it's like a Dave and Buster's type thing or something. Or a Chuck yeah, E. Exactly, Cheese or exactly whatever. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, no, I mean, th- 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 will they take a debit card? They will, but I like to use my cash. Okay. Well, I don't blame you there. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't blame you. It, but so it comes down to, you know. Uh, a horrible transaction, which is the plate thing you were describing. I'm not doing that right. for sure. Uh, or I like to use my cash, and you people are making this difficult. And so you're basically saying, I don't want you as a customer, Rusty. And you say, okay, then I won't be your customer. I'll go there you I'll go. go bowling somewhere else, you know. And so there you go. I'll look for my excitement elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, or good. you can use, if it's something you're you're not uh, wanting to take a stand on, you know, it's not, I mean, I don't make a principled, uh, uh, picketing, uh, stand on every single transaction I do. I just look at it and go, you know, this one's not worth it. I'm not fighting this one or this one I'm going to fight and I'm not going to do this. And so, you know, I, uh, um, you know, I, I, uh, uh, so anyway, you just got to decide that and, and say, uh, I'm not going there, but you're right. There's more and more places that have gone to cashless. I was in a, uh, a breakfast place, a tiny little meat and three breakfast place off the side of the beaten path up off of, uh, uh, outside of Aspen, Colorado last year. And, um, they didn't take cash. And I was like, God, I'm, I mean, it was like a, Biscuits and gravy yeah, kind right. of thing. I mean, it wasn't sure. like it wasn't like some kind of frou frou thing or something, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, I went in there and I was like, God, I'm, I, I just wonder I didn't leave my debit card like back at the hotel or something. I would have had to go back and get that, yeah. or you know, keep. Wonder my, what keep the reason my, is. Keep my wife. In their case, they were doing it uh, because they were 
Well, it's Aspen. I mean, they're just, they're frou frou, right? So the the food wasn't frou frou, but they have the little thing come to the table and you know and check you out with this high tech thing at the oh, table. Oh, gotcha. The biscuits weren't high tech, but the payment yeah. methodology was high yeah, tech. They're paying for that, and though. so yeah, they are, and uh, like three percent every yeah. time you swipe I don't for understand your biscuit. That. For biscuits, I'd take yeah. a dollar. But uh, um, but that's you know. So anyway, I was just I, I had a pocket full of cash. I always do, but yeah. I, thank goodness I had a debit card because Sharon would probably still be there washing dishes. But <laughs> <laughs> I would yeah. love to see an Can Instagram see post this? from Dave Ramsey. I'm just like Sharon saying, and I stopped. I can't off pay beat. for my meal. Dave's in the back washing dishes, <laughs> and then they found out who you were. They'd probably make you mop the floor too. Yeah, twice. Twice, just for good measure. That's fantastic. To, yeah, but I mean that—that's the kind of thing he's running into. Is yeah. he's, um, and there was a there was a minute during COVID. I haven't heard it lately that some places quit taking cash because they thought the little COVIDs were on the money, and um, <laughs> there wasn't any. You know, I'm like sorry. The little, the I'm little trying co- not to laugh, but you just said little COVIDs. Well, I think they thought the COVID. You know, everybody was worried about what the COVIDs <laughs> I'm were. On. These little jurors, like when they show those uh, cleaning commercials, the bugs, and they magnify. Well, they were. It. I mean, they were everywhere for a while, and. <laughs> Now they're now they now they only use certain channels. So um, apparently, but um, you just gotta you gotta know how they behave these yeah. days. So <laughs> they don't um, like plexiglass. I'll tell you that. Well, I don't know. The plexiglass has come down a lot of places now. I was oh. in the donut shop the other day, and there was plexiglass before, and now it's down. So yeah, I went to a couple of amusement parks this summer. And I told my wife, I said, we should have gotten to the, we should have found yes. some company to invest in. We has got a yes, mutual fund. Yes, I should have opened a plexiglass, plexiglass company. That would have been a boon last year. Yeah. That would have been a nice ROI on so, that. But yeah, that's, you know, there's situations like that where they wouldn't take cash because they're worried about germs. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> money is germy. There's no question about that. Yeah. Don't, don't put that in your mouth. It's true. And <laughs> <laughs> coins as well. <laughs> you remember that? Oh, yeah. Oh, gross. All right. Chad is with us. Chad's in Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, Chad. How are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. What's up? Well, we're in a position where we uh, we owe $163,000 on our mortgage, our house, mm-hmm. and I'm in a position to pay it off. How much money do you have? I have... More, I have 185000 in cash, mm-hmm. I'm debt-free. Mm-hmm. Um, we expect to make 300000 plus a year. Cool. What is it you love about being in debt on your mortgage? Pardon? What is it you love about being in debt on your mortgage? I don't love it, but my accountant, we have a, we have a small business, mm-hmm. and... Um, my accountant has told me that it's a bad idea to pay off your mortgage because mm-hmm. we're on a low mortgage rate. Mm-hmm. He says we should invest our money mm-hmm. um, and let. Uh, I've got five years left on a ten-year note. Uh, so, what's your house worth? Oh, uh, this the farm is worth probably five hundred thousand. Okay. Well, you should probably go get a bigger mortgage on it because rates are down. Get a bigger mortgage. If you're going to keep that accountant, you should, because that's what his theory is. My well, theory, my theory, however, is fire your accountant and pay off your mortgage today. Today, both, because your accountant doesn't share your values, and you have more money than he does. <laughs> this is the Ramsey Show. paying your overpriced wireless provider and switch to Pure Talk. They use the same network as the larger providers for much less. For just $30 a month, get unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data with no contract. The average family saves over $70 a month by switching to Pure Talk. Just go to puretalk.com and enter the promo code RAMSEY to save 50% off your first month. Pure Talk, simply smarter wireless.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. If you are not strapped with student loan payments, odds are you know someone who is. Millions are putting off things like buying a house or having kids or even getting married. They're waiting and waiting and waiting on the government to save them with student loan forgiveness. This is a joke. We produced a new documentary, a full-length docu- documentary, world-class production, called Borrowed Future. It follows the track of the Borrowed Future podcast, only it's better. And millions and millions of you have listened to the Borrowed Future podcast. It uncovers the dark side of the student loan industry and exposes how the system is built to work against you. So I want you to save the date, and I want you to tell everybody about it. Make a point to watch on October 14th. You'll see folks weigh in on the epic failure, otherwise known as the student loan program, with featured interviews from all kinds of industry insiders, thought leaders like Seth Godin, Seth Frotman, Dr. John Deloney, lots of teens being interviewed. It'll blow your mind. We're coming at this hard, I'm going to tell you. Some of you aren't going to like it, which was my intent. And we're taking some big swings at the student loan problem. We want to educate you parents and students across the country how evil this situation is. And you do not have to take out loans to get a college education. It is possible to graduate debt-free and avoid the predatory student loan industry. Borrowed Future premieres on all digital platforms, or almost all of them, October the 14th. You can find that on your television program, wherever you go and watch good stuff. And uh, we'll be listing all the different places as as we get them all contracted as you uh, go to borrowedfuture.com. Be sure and mark it down now. October the 14th. You don't want to miss the premiere of this. It's going to be a something everyone's talking about. Our question of the day is from Blinds.com. Find out for yourself why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings with free samples, free shipping, and new promos all the time. You'll save even more. Use the promo code RAMSEY to get the best possible deal. Today's question comes from Luke in Chicago. I'm an accountant with a Fortune 500 company making $65,000 a year. I'll get a promotion next year where I'll earn $75,000. My wife and I are working the baby steps and will be debt-free in two and a half years. I was recently offered a job in a CPA firm at $60,000 that would be more geared towards actual clients and tax returns, which I've always wanted to see that side of the industry, and I think it could provide more opportunity for growth in the long run. However, I would be forfeiting the promotion and raise, plus... I would have to repay $4,000 for MBA classes, which were paid for by my company. Should I stay at my current job while working the baby steps, wife going back to school, and possibly having another baby in the near future, or is it worth taking a chance to pursue this new career path? I would stay put right now with the one caveat that when you tell the new offer uh, that you're grateful for the offer, but it's a pay cut and uh, it's not a good move for you right now. You're really grateful, but it's too much of a cut based on opportunities at your current company. Let's see what they say. How bad do they want you? Uh, but at the current offer, I would sit tight. And this is hard for people because I get that uh, Luke saying, all right, this is kind of the side of, of accounting that I always have wanted to do. But here's the good news, Luke. You're in a Fortune 500 company. Uh, they've trained you, looks like, or at least they paid for your training with an MBA. Uh, you're going to get m- a promotion, more money, and experience. And you're acting as though this is the only opportunity you'll ever have have to move over to this side of maybe front-facing, you know, client-facing accounting work, and that's simply not true. So it feels good uh, to get an offer. It makes us feel good. We feel wanted and valuable, but you've got to look at the long-term big picture. So my advice would be sit tight, look for something better. Let me ask you this. In in the what you teach, um, I know how you teach about asking for a raise, adding value. If he went back and said, I would be willing to add something to my duties Mm -hmm. at the new place. You're talking to your potential new employer. That's right. I'd be willing to do some extra work so that I didn't get a pay cut 
and you had to, and you cover my MBA problem. Right. Because here's my problem, guys. I really want to work over there. Yep. But I'm making sixty five now, and it's going to cost me four grand an MBA. If we can cover that, yep. I'll do some extra work for you. If you'll tell me what to do, um, but but to add value. But if you but you got to help me and, and at least meet what I'm doing now. Yeah. And if you can't, that's okay. I understand. Yep. I'll, I'll just sit tight. But but if you can, then I think we can get a deal done. Yeah. Is that is that an unreasonable? I, as an employer, if someone came at me that way, I would not be offended. It's certainly not unreasonable. It's a version of what I told him to do. He could say to them, "Hey, look, I can't make this work financially," and then they're going to ask questions if they're really no, interested. I, I would just say what. what no, it takes. I know. The only thing I'm concerned about is if he says, "If I leave, um, you guys would have to." And, and he, I understand your offer, but still coming out of pocket the 4K for his MBA that could raise a flag. Well, you left them. Will you leave us? Mm-hmm. See, that's why the company paid for his MBA. Mm-hmm. They kind of put that incentive there for him not to leave. I don't think it's a red flag, but I'm saying it could be to some. Whereas I don't think he has to get into that. I think he can say, I'd really like to be here, but you guys aren't. This offer yeah. isn't where I need to be. And candidly, if my CFO it, came in and said, uh, we have a candidate and we're offering 60 and he needs 65 and four to pay off his MBA to come on. It's the guy we want. Should we do it? I would say do it. Yeah. And especially in today's hiring environment. Well, absolutely. Which is why I think it's worth for him to just say, look, guys, I can't do it. At well, this I just say, yeah, here's what I've got now. That's it. And I, I can't, I, I got a baby. I, you know, I, I got to, I got to make this happen. That's it. And so if we can make this happen and I don't mind doing something extra, I'll, I'll throw in added value. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, the answer is I like what you said. I really yeah, like okay. it. It's a little bit, it's a little bit more forward thinking and saying, Hey, a little here's bit more aggressive, a little bit more aggressive, but it's not going to offend anybody. There's nothing that's in and if any it does, way. So what? Well, then there's your sign. Yeah. <laughs> to borrow a uh, your sign. yeah, <laughs> to borrow Bill Ingvall, a little uh, classic light. It is from yeah. twenty five years I've ago. I've seen a lot of Jeff Foxworthy specials. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> he's all of them memorized. But, yeah. Yeah. All right, Whitney's with us in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hi, Whitney. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's up? I am currently um, transitioning jobs and. My current employer offers a Roth 401k, which I've been very happy with, but my new employer is on a pension fund. And I just don't know anything about pensions or how to kind of navigate that when I'm saving for retirement. They don't have anything except a pension? No. It's EMS, and that's what we get. (laughs) Yuck. Okay. Well, that's what you get then. I mean, they put it all in. You're not putting anything in, right? No, we have to contribute 8%, and then they'll match. It's what? Yeah, Where are you? Oklahoma. What, state? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Oklahoma State, government. Yeah, it's the Oklahoma Public Employment Retirement. Yeah, you're working for the state of Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, all right. Crap. Okay, well, yeah, you're putting in 8% in something you have no control over that's probably going to yield you about 6%. Yeah. And so in addition to that, you need to be saving for retirement. Okay. Could I roll my Roth 401k to a traditional Roth and keep contributing that way? You can roll your Roth 401k to a traditional or to a Roth IRA, and you should. And you can add new. There are technically two accounts, but every year you can open... You can open a Roth IRA separately in good mutual funds. So get in touch with your SmartVestor Pro and do your rollover and set up a personal Roth in addition to this pension that you're doing with the state of Oklahoma. That's that uh, took me a second to catch up with you. I'm sorry. I didn't understand where you were. Good question. Thanks for joining us.
In the lobby of Ramsey Solutions on the Dead Free Stage. Alex is with us. Hey, Alex, how are you, man? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you? Better than I deserve. Where do you live? Uh, Memphis, Tennessee. All right. A couple hours down the road, made it up here to do a debt-free scream. How much have you paid off? It was just a little under 74000 Excellent. And your, uh, how long did this take you? Two years. Okay. Uh, There's a little story. I cash flowed nursing school in between that, so uh, oh, wow. two years was paying off debt. Though. Okay. All right. And your range of income during that time? About 80000 to 110 Okay. So you're out of nursing school now? Yes, sir. Okay. About, about a year out now. What kind of debt was the 74? Um, about 50,000 was student loans. Mm-hmm. Uh, car was 12. Mm-hmm. My dog's eye surgery is 4,000 and like laptop and, and just about any, anything but credit cards, to be honest with you. Okay. Just life and, uh, but somewhere around that two year mark or whatever, you woke up as a young single guy. How old are you? 32. And you woke up back in your... Th- 20s yes, and said i this isn't working tell me your story what happened um try to keep it brief in about 2015 uh, my mom gave me the total money makeover and she had a note written in there that she um she said if you follow this you know you can retire a millionaire um we didn't come from money so it flabbergasted when i saw that i was like there's no way so naturally what do you do when somebody gives you a book as a gift you put it away so yeah, you set it out for a coaster <laughs> yes sir so um Fast forward to about 2017, I was in the middle of a move, and I um, came across a book, and I read it, or I saw the note, and I, I was like, I'll give it a shot. So I read it in a couple of days, and I finally had my, I've had a moment, you know, reading the stories were inspirational, and it was, uh, after that, it was just game on, just paying off debt, and then, um, you know, cash flow, nursing school in between that, so it was a little pause for 20 months total, but just didn't stop after that. Wow, good for you. So you so. just tore into it. Yes, sir. All right. So once you read it, you're like, that's it. I'm done. Let's do it. Because I didn't never, I mean, in my 20s, I was just, it never really occurred to me. Like, I, you know, made all the payments on time. So it never really kind of clicks that you're really, you know, in the red as far as negative. And mm-hmm. I just finally had my, I've had a moment, you know, some of my friends were much further along, like, you know, in life and going on trips and stuff. And I was like, all I'm doing is working, paying bills, working, paying bills. And the, just that circle got, you know, a little tired of it. How much was nursing school? Do you mind me asking? Did you cash flowed? Uh, I think it was t- tuition. I think it was around twenty thousand. I mean, books and other miscellaneous stuffs around there, but I think it was about twenty thousand. Two year program? Uh, one year. One year program. Yes, okay. Sir. So, how far along were you in paying off debt out of this? Out of the seventy four, how much were you had you paid off as you began to then go into nursing school? I think it was. Maybe a year. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, no, that's okay. It's, I, think it's, I think it's roughly yeah. about a year. Yeah, really okay. interesting. Wow. Very yes, interesting. Yeah, a cool process. Yeah. So now you're 32 debt-free and a nurse. Yes, sir. Awesome. RN, LPN, what? RN. Okay, yes, sir. Wow. That's an awesome career. Yes, sir. Very good. Yes, sir. Very good. Very cool. How's it feel? I, I, it still kind of hasn't sank in yet. I mean, it's, it's very liberating. Um, a good buddy of mine... Um, he's also debt free. Did the program. We went on a uh, celebratory uh, golf trip to Denver um, th- earlier this month. So That's fun. Oh, uh, we had so much fun. It was a blast. It was it was a lot of fun. Great. So, yeah, you ought to do something like that to celebrate debt free. Yes, sir. <laughs> I love it. Very good. Good for you. Yes, sir. And uh, that's pretty incredible. So, has it um, emotionally and intellectually sunk in yet that your mom was right? You're going to be a millionaire. I want to retire with two million now. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah, it's it's it's. He did the so math. That's a yes, yeah, he right. did the math. I'm yeah. an yeah. I want ten million. <laughs> yes, sir. It has, but it's it's been a it's been a fun journey. But I'm looking forward to the next uh, steps. Met some, or some some people with some EDM shirts out there. So that's my uh, that's my next goal. Yeah, yes, everyday millionaires, baby step millionaires. Yes, I sir. love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, you're there, man. That's what was amazing. the hardest part for you? Um, honestly, it's just some days when you just you just get tired of doing it over and over and over again. Um, it's a grind. I, I mean, it is a grind. It really is a grind. Yes, sir. Um, that's what I would say. It's just it just the days that you're not expecting where you're just like, I don't want to do this. I want to just go out to eat. I want to go just splurge. And But, you know, you just keep to it and stuff. So the good thing is um, I was a, a restaurant bartender uh, before that. So it was good having cash every day so I could throw money at debt just every couple of days. So kind of kept me... Um, you know, on the straight If you throw it at the dead, it's out of your hands, and you can't do something with it. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, you're hiding it from yourself. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's good. Yes, sir. 
Gives you an incentive to work, too, because you Very see those so. numbers come down. Yes, sir. Yeah. So what do you tell people the key to getting out of debt is? Um, you got to find your why. But, I mean, mainly the, the every dollar budget was – amazing i mean it's just so user friendly it's very easy and you know and just um every time you hit a little milestone or a thousand or something like that you know it's you know it's going down but you know definitely um just find your why in the budgeting so what's your why um we uh my father died at a young age and so my mom had at the time three kids and um it's no, no fault of her but we just didn't have a lot of money um growing up and so i realized at a young age whatever i want whatever i one in this world, you know, um, I'll have to go out and get it. And so um, I just want to make things, you know, better and brighter, um, kind of write my own story going forward. Mm. So. You, have, you say you have two siblings? Uh, I have four. Um, we had at the time um, when my father passed away, we've got a, a younger brother, um, mm -hmm. different dad, but yeah. yes, sir. So that same message set in on all of you or just you? <laughs> trying to get um, no, the, no the, the message uh, of if i want it i gotta go get it oh 100 100 yeah. yes sir yeah that's not a bad message no even if it comes from a place of uh where your mom was struggling to do everything mm -hmm. and it, it, you know it's a, a place of lack but uh it still it still wakes that part up in you where and it, and it never really goes to sleep again no uh, I, it's personal responsibility at a different kind of visceral level yeah. Yeah, so yeah, she uh, she gave me my hard work, uh, yeah. the discipline of that. So I mean, I thank her every day for that. So. Yeah, I think she's probably a rock star. <laughs> she is. She's great. She's probably a pretty incredible lady. Mm. Yeah. Very neat. That's so very cool. neat. Good stuff. Yeah. Great, great story. Who are your biggest thank cheerleaders? You. Uh, the guy I was living with at the time, my good friend Adam Blair, did the program. Um, Angie, my girlfriend over here, and uh, you know, families and friends would always just, hey, how much you paid off? You know, kind of just kind of reminding me and stuff like that. But I didn't have any. Um, any barriers or anybody like naysayers and stuff. So everybody was really uh, encouraging. So it yeah. was great. That's helpful. Yes, yeah, sir. that is helpful. That, that matters a lot, having people in your corner screaming mm -hmm. for Very you. Much so. Good stuff, man. Proud of you. Thank you so much. You're a hero. You. you did it. You did what your mom said. And now you're going to go on and be a Baby Steps millionaire and prove it. You, yes, sir. She's exactly right. You do the stuff in that book, it'll take you there. Yes, sir. And good Lord, you're 32. You're definitely going to be there. <laughs> definitely going to be there. I love it. I love it. All right. We've got a copy of The Legacy Journey for you because that's definitely the next chapter like we're just talking about yes, sir. in your story. And a copy of the Total Money Makeover for you to give away so that someone can... Pack it away with a note that you write, and two years later when they're moving, it'll come out of the box. This book gets out that way. Yeah, it, this book has a delayed, it's like a smart bomb. Yeah, it has a delayed yeah, reaction yeah. with people. You're like the human version of Where's Waldo? Oh. No. <laughs> Where's Dave? The book keeps popping up. It just up. pops up later. I love yeah. that. Yeah, so we're going to give you one of those. <laughs> put seed out there for one more person to yes. delay <laughs> their change. That's that's the way it works, so I love it. All right, and uh, so Alex from Memphis, 74000 paid off in two years, making 80 to one. 10, 32, and cash flowed nursing school. What a rock star. Count it down. Let's hear a debt free scream. Three, two, one. I'm debt free. Yeah. Oh, by the way, a cash flow nursing school, yeah. tending bar, yeah. and going to class. Yes. And past yeah. my bars. Yeah. And. Don't call me and tell me you have to quit work and yes. sit at home and go $50,000 of student loan debt to be a nurse, okay? Because yep. I've met Alex. That's right. And I've yeah. got proof. Yeah. 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 And don't tell me that uh, because of your debt, you can't pursue your dream. Ding, ding. He just did it. Yeah, there's a, a Ken Coleman. There's a Ken Coleman. I, I, see, that's that's why you're here, because you see stuff like that that I don't see. That's good. <laughs> I like it. This is The Ramsey Show.
scripture of the day, 2 Chronicles 2015. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Babe Ruth said, every strike brings me closer to the next home run. Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Hunter is with us in Atlanta. Hi, Hunter. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave. Um, I'm going to try and be brief. It's a lot, but uh, basically my fiance and I are looking to buy a house shortly, um, and I need some advice. Okay. I'm a college student. Mm-hmm. I do work full time. Neither of us have any debt. I make between forty and forty five thousand a year while in school. Uh-huh. Um and she is completing her master's program and will be taking over a number of franchises from that are owned by her family. Um she already has a little over a million dollars in her trust and not long ago, I started your plan. I'm done with step one, two, and three. Um, and basically, I'm I'm curious as to what we should do from here. I know that obviously debt is um, bad. Don't want to go in debt, but mm-hmm. I I struggle seeing a way that we can purchase a house without using the money that's in her trust mm-hmm. and without going into debt. How old are you? Uh, we're both 23. Cool. When are you getting married? Within within a year, not not the end of this calendar year, but when will when will the two of you graduate? Um, I well, I am fed up with college, honestly, and I just had open heart surgery and I transferred schools and changed majors, which has put me far behind. Um, she graduates this December, and I will be done beginning of next year. Why are you fed up with school? I. Basically, the the line of work that I'm in, I feel like I've gained much more knowledge there than I have and ever will in college. What do you do? Um, farming. Is that what you want to do long term? Not necessarily the labor side, but I would be very interested in selling produce or anything in the ag industry. Okay. Um, so let's. I, I, I would not be opposed to farming, but. Right. I would have to make substantially more money than what I'm being paid. Okay, so let's go back to what you just said. Based on what you know now, what you've learned, and where your position within the farming and ag industry, does it make sense to you to stay in school to finish out where you are? Do you think it's going to put you further ahead? Is it going to get you qualified to do the thing you ultimately want to do, yes or no? No, honestly. Um uh, I don't think so. So but let me ask you. That let me, being said, hold on a second. Let me ask you an alternative question. So if you stay, let's say you walk today, and I'm not telling you to walk, but if you if you walked and you went at this full time and you worked your way up and you learned more about what you're doing and you made great relationships within the farming and ag and you crossed over into that specific area you mentioned, uh, could you do that faster and make more money in the amount of time it would take you to stay in school and work part time? You see, I I have contemplated that exact question okay, good. myself. Uh, Great, uh, for quite some time now. And the school that I'm in, I'm I'm getting a degree that is pertinent to what I do. Okay. Um, I'm getting an ag business degree and a minor in agronomy. So it is it is, you know, there's a direct correlation between my degree and what I plan on doing and what I am doing now. Um, well, so now a minute ago, ago prob- said, ag business will probably would further you, wouldn't it? Well, and you would think so, but it, I haven't learned anything. And I, I'm not trying to bash college. I think college is great. And there's a lot of people that gain a lot of information from it. Um, but me personally, I've I've learned better through hands-on experience, I think. And what I year of school that. are you in? Well, I, to make it short, I am a senior, but I still have 30 hours to go from the Due to the change in major, so you've not had any ag major. business classes that taught you anything that you didn't already know. 
Because at 23, yeah. I was learning accounting that's and statistics correct. I didn't know. No, that's, uh, I would I would say that's correct. I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be boastful. I'm not trying to act like a know-it-all. But with me working on this farm and... I'm not talking the about the side, agriculture part. I'm talking about the business part. Oh, uh, no. So you know sure. accounting really inside and out. So. You know statistical analysis and data analysis inside and out. You know uh, marketing inside and out without ever having taken a class. No, I have taken... Uh, Macro and microeconomics. I know, but you said you taken. haven't learned anything. No, yeah, I made A's in all those classes with very, very little studying. On macro and microecon. Okay. Yes, and, and marketing and the... Yeah. Uh, right. Here's the deal. The, you're 30 uh, hours away. Classes. Here's the deal, Hunter. You're 30 hours away. Go finish. Uh, finish it up at this point. Yeah, finish but, it. But don't be all down in the dumps about it. Either decide to, to move on or finish. I wouldn't buy a house right now. Yeah. Answer, yeah. Your, answer your original question. You don't need to buy a house right no. now. You two need to get married, settle down, rent for uh, un, until both of you finish up your degrees, and then rent for a little while longer, and then buy a house. And yes, you can use our trust fund to buy a house by then, but that's going to be two years into your marriage, and you're fine to rent for the first two years of marriage. It's not the end of the world. It's a little bit of time for you guys yeah. to get your life foundations laid, and then you'll decide. She'll be neck deep and running those franchises by then. Yep. I take it she's getting an MBA. Uh, yes, yeah. that's correct. Okay. Cool. And that, that was exactly my plan. Um, that's, that's verbatim uh, what we said to do was to rent for the first year or two mm -hmm. and then look at doing something. I just don't know how Buy with I feel. A, because, well, I mean, listen, you, you married a woman with a million dollars and you're, she's going to buy, you're going to buy a house with some of that money. I mean, it, it you know, it, it, it's an awkward feeling. Because you're you're a guy that works hard and earns your keep, and it doesn't you feel like you hit the lottery or something, or you're cheating or something, and you're not cheating, yeah. but it, but it, admittedly it's awkward. Um, do you think he feels a little bit of guilt about using some of the trust money? I sure, I heard a little bit of that. Sure, it's wants, awkward. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who? I mean, most people would. Sure. Uh, unless you're unless he's like a gold digger or something, you know, yeah, but he's not. He's no. a good guy. Super responsible. And so, yeah, you're fine. I, I, but I think you just say out loud, this feels awkward. And, you know, if you want to put a uh, – where there's extreme differences in the wealth of a couple getting married, that's the only time that I am okay with a prenup. Uh, and this is pretty extreme. Uh, she's getting all these franchises and this – trust fund yeah now you don't have access to the trust fund but if you move money out of the trust fund and put it in a house in both your names now you got access to it so you could have a prenup to protect her uh in the event of that and a will to protect her in the event of that and so on so um you know that's the plan uh, but i mean it, if that helps you feel less awkward uh that would be an okay thing to offer but i i think that um you know, I, I think she's probably protected by the laws in most states anyway if you used her family money after marriage to buy a house um, in terms of legally protected. So, I But I'm not an attorney. You'd have to check with one to be sure. But that, that's how I feel about it. But I, I, I do understand the awkwardness. That is a standard. That's a normal feeling, yeah. Ken. I love your advice, too, because here's the deal. You're right, Dave. She's going to be fresh out of an MBA program, taking on these franchises for the family business. A lot of self-induced pressure there. They're a young couple. Got to learn how to live together and learn how to be married. The first two years are weird. She did. She does life the way that she saw in her house. You do life the way that he, that you saw. And so I love the idea of renting, shopping for homes, you know, and even though you're not buying, look at what you like and decide. Take a couple years to breathe and then make that big decision. I love that for all of those reasons not just the finances yep that's the plan hey man thank you for calling it's an interesting yeah. question sharp young man interesting question i would go ahead and finish the degree though yeah i think i think that's a, i think that's a win all right that puts this hour in the books good show ken appreciate you hanging out with me ken coleman ramsey personality today james childs is our producer back in the chair producing again kelly daniel the band is back together We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus.
have a friend or family member that needs a daily dose of Ramsey advice in their life? Let them know about the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast. It's a quick hit of advice about life and money in under 10 minutes. Check out the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast wherever you listen to podcasts.